I welcome you to our signature event here at Western, uh, sponsored by the libraries, uh, as part of International Open Access Week, which runs from October 24th to 30th. And although this is the fifth year, there's been either a day or a week, it's the first time I question why the orange color. And I think it's probably as close to Halloween in every case, but you know, it takes a while to register, I guess. So as you probably know, and, and I may be uh, you know, preaching to the converted, but uh, open access is defined as access to a scholarly works um, that is free of any cost barriers, so subscription fees, licensing fees, or pay-per-view fees, and permission barriers in terms of copyright and licensing restrictions. Although, of course, we always want the moral rights to be maintained with proper uh, attribution. So it includes open access journals that employ an alternate business model to uh, defray the cost, because there are always costs. Uh, the libraries bring the electronic journals to you free of charge. You, you, I, you, I, I pay the bills. Um, you enjoy the benefits, uh, which is free to the, to the consumer. And then open access archives, which are publicly accessible repositories where authors can self-archive their scholarly output. So I'm proud to say that Western Libraries was there at the beginning of the uh, revolution by uh, research libraries um, when there were significant changes happening in the scholarly communication uh, system, at least from the, the library's perspective, perspective, in that Western uh, Libraries was a founding member of SPARC, the um, scholarly publication and research uh, coalition from the Association of Research Libraries, uh, which started in 1998. And SPARC provided both financial and moral support uh, to individuals, to publishers, to editors, to societies who wanted to challenge the system as it was at the time, which was dominated by the uh, commercial publishers. And that was a time when the world was largely um, print-based, and of course we've moved a lot to the digital world. And today's uh, panel is evidence of the fact that there is uh, an amazing amount of digital scholarship going on on an international uh, level. And in a more local uh, context, uh, Western Libraries has established Scholarship at Western, which is our institutional repository to host and showcase digital scholarship at Western, including journal articles, conference papers, and dissertations. And if you're not already in there, please uh, step forward and speak to Adrian Ho and, and make yourself uh, visible to the world. One of the wonderful, tangible benefits of open access is that uh, open access publications tend to have a very high rate of, of citation uh, in some subject areas higher than uh, citations in uh, uh, commercial publications. Uh, so, in addition, a Scholarship at Western provides an online platform and infrastructure for the publication of peer-reviewed journals. And again, if you've been dying to start your own peer-reviewed journal at Western and want to have do it within a, a framework that supports the peer review uh, and the and the publishing, uh, you check with uh, with Adrian again. And one example, and there are many now actually, but one example is that the Teaching Support Center, in partnership with Western Libraries, has f developed an open access journal for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. That's the official journal of the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. In addition, Scholarship at Western has the Researcher Gallery, which offers virtual space for Western's researchers to create their own website and feature the academic activity. Um, there are thousands of open access journals um, in the world. In fact, over 90% of journals in all disciplines um, are available online, and most of those offer some form of open access. There may be delays, there may be restrictions, but open access has taken off and it is a, a mode of, of dissemination and accessibility. And more recently, there's a trend to open data, to sharing observations and results as they are created, as well as providing open access uh, dissemination. And that's the, the theme uh, behind our speakers today. Uh, so open access and digital repositories and open data are evidence of change in scholarly communication and as aspects of development in digital scholarship. Today, we have three speakers who will share their experiences, and they are, I say, experiments, with digital scholarship using technology to facilitate communication and collaboration among researchers across disciplines, across institutions, and across geographic jurisdictions, truly, le truly leading edge scholarship on an international scale. Uh, that's my soapbox when I, you know, I told Adrian, you know, stand here, I'll do my, uh, my little speech here about open access and, and the value of sharing uh, scholarly results. So now I will introduce the, the speakers in the order in which they will speak. And then we will have time after the three speakers uh, to interact with the speakers and questions and answers and explore aspects of their, their research and um, anything they haven't said uh, that you want to know more about. Um, I'm sure they'll be more than willing to uh, uh, give you a content or an opinion or a perspective. So our first speaker, um, Dr. David Heap, is a member of the Department of French Studies at Western. 
Uh, David's research on the pronomial morphology of Romance languages led him to search for the unpublished field notebooks of Linguistic Atlas of the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula ALPI, but it's by a Spanish acronym, and Eva, who's in the audience and is a Spanish speaker, will appreciate the fact I didn't try to render it in Spanish, uh, from the 1930s. Uh, the web publication of these notebook images has since led to collaboration with a team based in Spain working on the retranscription of the AOPI, which will in time produce a searchable online linguistic atlas from these now historical dialect data. Uh, a second speaker, Dr. Uh, James Avut, is an associate professor in geography at Western. His broad area of research interest is urban climatology with a specialization in the measurement and modeling of surface temperatures in urban areas. His work, funded by NSERC, has focused on the three-dimensional structure of the urban surface and its impact on both microscale temperatures and the temperatures observed by remote sensors. Uh, Dr. Voot is currently a co-PI on the Environmental Prediction for Canadian Cities Network, which has a wonderful acronym that he will share with us. A 1.4 million network funded by the Canadian Foundation of Climate and Af Atmosphere Sciences that is operating sites in Montreal and Vancouver as part of a project to develop an urban atmosphere model component for the Canadian weather forecasting system. And as we head into the winter months, we're sure we'll be grateful for your discoveries. Uh, Dr. Yolanda Paul is currently Associate Professor in the Department of French Studies at Western, and she also holds the Canada Research Chair in Linguistics. She received her PhD from McGill in 2000 and has been at Western since 2002. Her research focuses on the syntax of Malagasy, the language spoken in Madagascar. As part of her ongoing research, she created an online database of Malagasy linguistic data, and she will share her insights uh, today. So I, I turn it over to Dave. So I always ask this, but I know the answer. Has anybody here ever used the Linguistic Atlas? The wonderful 20th century, 19th, 20th century, 20th century uh, objects. I have the print version, obviously, here. This wasn't a pizza. I know I got everybody's hopes up. <laughs> um, of the Alpi, the Atlas Linguistico de Peninsula Iberica. Um, the only volume that was published in 1962, um, where on the maps are, there's about 70 maps of linguistic forms uh, I'm just trying to get the front matter here. I'm just trying to get past the front matter. The linguistic map. So that's the map for B. Aveja, Aveja, uh, in the other various Romance languages. On a base map in red, and then the um, linguistic forms are transcribed in phonetic notation. Uh, these guys used uh, uh, custom phonetic alphabet because they didn't trust the international phonetic alphabet because it wasn't detailed enough, so they used a more detailed phonetic transcription, um, which was so detailed that they couldn't print this. So these are hand engraved uh, every transcription and then corrected. So that's what that's the old that's the, the analog version. The story of the Alpi, uh, as Elena knows, I can go on about it at length, but I won't. So the linguistic atlas of the Iberian Peninsula was a project started in the 30s. Uh, under the Republican government in Spain, and most of the data was gathered between 31 and 36. Uh, the trivia question then is what happened in 1936? Bad things happened in 1936 in the Iberian Peninsula for lots of things, and in particular, for well, among other things, for linguistic researchers. So the project was interrupted. The materials, the notebooks, the field notebooks, went into exile. They came back from exile without the director of the project in 1950-51. Three of the original field workers continued the publication, which eventually led to this uh, gorgeous document in 1962, which should have been the first of at least 10 volumes. But one volume was published, and the uh, then Spanish government decided that was enough. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, it stopped there. So most of the data remained unpublished. Collected in 30 to 36, uh, a little bit of the last bits of the data were collected in the 40s and 50s. Uh, mostly one volume published in 62, less than 10% of the data. Uh, and then it get, goes to sleep for decades. Um, so it literally sits on the shelf. Uh, fortunately, well, the, the different field workers held on to it at home. Uh, fortunately, it was well preserved. In fact, one of them was provincial librarian for the province of Oviedo, and he had it nicely packaged at home. As his daughters told me when I went to look for it, waiting for somebody to take an interest in the project. Uh, for a variety of uh, reasons, the Spanish schools of dialectology didn't take an interest in it between the 60s and the end of the millennium. I went looking for it, found it sitting on the shelves, waiting for somebody to take an interest in it. 
So what do you do? I went looking, I was like word nerd stuff, linguist stuff. I was looking for pro pronouns, right? So there, it turns out there's some interesting pronoun data, so I was happy to find that. But having spent a certain length of time tracking the materials down, it was split up. It was in three different locations, uh, a library archive, a provincial uh, institute archive, and a private home, literally like where dad left it in, in, in an apartment in Oviedo. So having spent the time finding it, I didn't want the next researcher who had the bright idea of what's in the Alpi to have to go through these many steps, because in fact, well, for a variety of reasons, it wasn't even open access. I mean, some of it was sort of buddy access. If you knew the right people, you could get into it. Some of it uh, was treated as the inheritance of the son of the field worker, and he needed to sign off on it. And some of it was literally sitting at home waiting for the field worker's family to, you know, somebody to find them and ask about it, which was me. Um, so I was faced with this massive paper, much more than I could deal with, but in my academic interest, interested in the pronominal morphology, though it's beautiful for pro pro pronominal morphology, you say that 10 times fast. Um, but I wanted to make it available. Having spent four decades almost ignoring the project, the Spanish Academy wasn't jumping up and down to republish this. I did publish a note in uh, uh, the Revista de Filología uh, Española to say, hey, this material is here. Uh, we, it should be published. But it's, as you can tell, it's, it's a massive undertaking to do a, a print edition. And in between times, the, what had been the 19th and earliest 20th century um, standard of pr printing a published uh, print atlas like this uh, ceased to be a project that uh, anybody would fund or undertake because they recognize that it's a very unwieldy book. Uh, they're beautiful books, but even as a coffee table book, it's a little bit unwieldy uh, and very hard to consult uh, and not very easy to disseminate knowledge. So nobody was jumping up and down to publish the material. I was very excited about it. A few of the scholars that were found out about it were said, hey, this stuff is, still exists. This is cool. But how to make it available? So what I had, as Elena knows, uh, almost like a cubic meter of photocopies, basically. Two filing cabinets, four drawers full of field notebooks, which look like this. So these are, this is just a random uh, folder. But the field notebooks are literally photocopies of uh, hand transcriptions from what the field workers took as their phonetic transcriptions, again, mostly in the 1930s. Um, how to make this available? to the scientific community. My solution almost 10 years ago now, in 19, or in 2001, 2002, was uh, this, which does require a login, but you can create your own login. Uh, so this is, the website is westernlinguistics.ca slash alpi for the Spanish acronym. Uh, it has a little pull down menu because originally it was fully uh, heptilingual. It was in English and French as well as the four uh, Romance languages of the Iberian Peninsula, Spanish, Catalan, Gallego, and Portuguese. Not in Basque because there's no Basque data here. <coughs> when we transferred the, the server, the multilingual interface kind of didn't survive the transfer. There's a couple of things that didn't survive the transfer. So most of the interface mainly works in English, though there's occasional pull down menus which suggest you could switch it into Galician, which I encourage you to do. Um, if you like reading The other thing that died was the map search. So it used to be possible, it was quite a cool interface, to select points off a map of the Iberian Peninsula and zoom in and say, I want you know, these points from this point. That, um, for a variety of reasons, is no longer with us. So the database search requires you to know what you're looking for, basically, as databases tend to do. So this is um, an alphabetical list of Spanish and Portuguese provinces and one French département, or Sion. Uh, you can resort these. Uh, you're supposed to, yes. You can resort them by region. So Galicia, Portugal, uh, regions. Uh, so it's the same. It's the same point. The uh, same provinces sorted by region. So if we go back to the, what do we want here? Um, stuff that I know is there. So Cáceres and Badajoz, I know are there. So I'll select those. But you could select, you know, as many as you want. Um, and then we'll just select all the pages. So this, the other. Oh, see, so these are the points the survey points within the provinces. So what I've just selected, and we'll go back analog for a minute here, are the provinces of Badajoz and Cáceres, sort of west of Madrid, between Madrid and the Portuguese border, basically. Uh, and I'm going to select all of the points, the survey points, in each of those provinces. How am I doing for time? 
So, and now we get a, a, a menu of boxes which correspond to the questionnaire. Hmm, what's in the questionnaire, you ask? Funny you should ask. We've got the questionnaire here. Uh, this tells you all the questions that were asked in the printed questionnaire, right? So these guys correspond to a little printed notebook that went out with questions printed and then hand transcriptions. So this, as a, as a way of looking up what the questions were, can we get back there? Yes, we can get back there. So I'm going to ask for page two and page 24 because that has the cool phenomenal morphology on it. Uh, and now we should get a list of provinces, the survey point, and the pages which are available as a PDF or a JPEG. Um, and there's a, obviously a character problem with our accented characters, um, story of my online life. But this is what you get. So this is a scan of a photocopy of the original uh, fieldwork material. So this is the question they ask, you know, name, this is just data on the, the survey person, name, age, profession, literacy, origin of their father and their mother, and have they traveled. But you can literally leaf through, so information on the town or the village, uh, you can literally leaf through this page by page. Uh, and when you get really excited about it, well, here, I'll get excited about it here in a minute. Um, what you should get excited about, what we get excited about. Uh, you have the sentence that was asked in this area, was asked in Spanish in other areas, they would have translated into Galician or Catalan or Portuguese, ask this and their phonetic transcription. And you'll, I'll just note for those, anybody besides Elena use phonetic transcription, IPA? So the idea, you know what diacritics are, what symbols that you add to other symbols. So the, the guiding principle in Navarro Tomas's transcriptions are never use two diacritics or five will do the job, right? So you'll have a U with an arc and a curve or an A with a dot. And so, I mean, one of the challenges in these materials is uh, dealing with a very rich, information-rich transcription system. At this point, my initial gambit was I didn't, there's way too much information. There's something like 36,000 pages uh, of notebook data, two notebooks times 527 points, um, about 30, 30 pages per notebook. It's a lot of information, a lot of transcribed information. I can't even tell, you know, this is probably a diacritic, this is probably a life spec, right? So you could go back to the original, but uh, it, there's a lot of information there. In addition, um, you know, there's crossed out information, there's interlineal notes. I mean, it has all of the richness of any original manuscript. They will write notes in the margin as good field workers were, will do if somebody says or does something interesting, right? So this is way too much, as well, for most purposes, way too much information because what I'm interested in is, in terms of my linguistic publications, is just the fact that here he says say me, and here he says they say. So there's, there's a interesting phenomenal thing going on, which happens to be a phenomenon throughout the Iberian Peninsula. That's another story. So my original project was simply make the stuff available. It's the, the scientific community had been waiting for this, some of us, uh, for 70 years uh, since the project was announced. In fact, it was announced 25 years before that. It was a, really a beginning of the 19th, 20th century project that took a couple of decades to get on the road, then it got on the road and it got hung up for a variety of reasons. I didn't want to wait around. I wanted to make it available. So this website, which was originally, you can still find it actually under its Spanish acronym, alpi.ca, but it resolves to westerlinguistics.ca slash alpi, just because we had to move the server. So in, by 2002, I found this stuff in 99, 2000. By 2001, I was announcing it. By 2002, I wanted to put it online because this seemed like the fastest way to just make it available. Um, I wouldn't say it was an overnight success, but it, it gradually built. I mean, it is, as you can gather, a fairly specialized interest, but there was some pent-up demand, some pent-up interest in where this material was, so it got a lot of visits initially, and then registered users came back. Um, I used to have the web stats. I don't have them handy. There were well over 1,000. There were maybe 1,100 or 1,200 registered users from 20 or 30 countries, obviously mostly Hispanic countries. There were lots of users from continental Europe, German scholars, scholars from the Far East, Japanese scholars using the material. So I haven't yet tracked down, that's a, that I begin to, a task, an overdue task, to figure out who is citing the LP data. But anybody who's citing the LP data since 2001, 2002 is probably setting it off his website because most of it isn't there. Um, the success for me really was to get the Spanish Academy collectively, not the Royal Academy, 
so there's one academician involved now, uh, but to get the scientific community, academic community in Spain interested in the project. So by 2007, uh, I'd sort of broken through that wall and got the CSIC, the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, the equivalent of all of the research councils, like SHRC, NSERC, and uh, CIHR, all in one research council. I got them interested in this. They had originally sponsored this. Their predecessor, their Republican predecessor, had originally uh, sponsored this. So they sort of felt, and they published this volume in 62. So they did sort of, after a while, feel some reluctant ownership of the project. And what I sold them, the way we sold them, was the idea that we should do a 21st century atlas, which means transcribe it into a searchable database. Uh, which is a lot of finger wiggling, I mean, very specialized finger wiggling from uh, research assistants. Um, so that project has been running now for between two and three years, and it's the tab that I can't open here, which I'm very frustrated about. But it is a server, not here, but in Madrid, with collaborators in Barcelona, Madrid, Galicia, uh, Santiago de Compostela, and uh, Lisbon, and me here, and a fellow in Montreal with students working on it. Well, the idea there is we have actually higher quality scans of the same notebooks and uh, a page with fields that we can fill in with a phonetic alphabet, which is the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet reduction of this overly rich, for modern purposes, phonetic alphabet. So the task, and the, it, it is a, it's moving, but it's moving at its own rather Iberian pace, if you permit me the expression, uh, is making sure that we're all reducing the original transcriptions in the same way. So it, it is a sort of go slow to speed up uh, kind of thing. There is now 80 years of pent up demands of people wanting to read Alpi data. We would love to get it out fast, but we really want to make sure that we transcribe in the same way. So we have NICE, because the CSIC has put some resources on it, we have some nice online tools where people can pick these exotic symbols out of virtual keyboards. Um, there are uh, data integrity checks, so I can make sure that my research assistants are asleep on the job, at least they're not supposed to be asleep on the job, and that they're not just copying and pasting you know, stuff from one point to another. So I have to finish up. So that's where it's at now. The alpi.ca, now westernlinguistics.ca slash alpi, is basically stopped. We put almost half the data online. Um, we had a server death and a server transfer and a few other things. And basically this other, pro it was enough to get the interest in the other project going. And that's really where it should go because as geographers like Jamie know, where people, where geographic information now is at GIS. So where it should go, where it will go once we've transcribed it, the Physique server has a GIS mainframe and it will, will be able to integrate it with all of their other social science geographic data, right? So if you want to correlate linguistic data with you know, transport or economic data or something else, it'll be on the same platform. But we're still a few years from that because, as I say, the, the bottleneck is the transcription of these wonderfully uh, detailed phonetic transcriptions. So it was uh, made in Western, and it's still Western. It's still the place, the only place you can find mo most of this data online. So I, I, I always uh, tell people in Spain, you know, the obvious, the obvious shortest route between Santiago and Oviedo and Barcelona or Valencia, Elche now, obviously goes through Western Ontario. Right? That's where you want to look for it. Anyway, that's what I've got so far. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Jamie Boot. I realize I didn't put my name on the slide here. I'm, I'm representing the Environmental Prediction in Canadian Cities, which acronym becomes EPIC. So it's an EPIC project. Yeah, it, it has been EPIC. And uh, I'd like to thank Martin. Buzzard, who's here, because I think he's uh, responsible in large part for the fact that I am here in the sense that he's been the one that's taken some initiative in terms of looking at how this project can uh, work on its links with digital scholarship. So we're a multi-institutional network. The institutions are down here. They include Canadian institutions and international ones, as well as both academic and government agencies. So. Meteo France is the French agency that's responsible for forecasts in that uh, country, and Environment Canada, of course, is responsible for your forecast. Our funding agency is the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences. Sadly, they are about to go or start a new life in some other form because the government has chosen not to uh, renew their funding. So we're one of the last networks that they funded. So we started in 2006, and I guess we were originally uh, slated to go to about 2010, but 
we had money left over, and so they've extended us to the end of this year. So we're still working. This is our uh, logo. I guess we were originally uh, slated to go to about 2010, but uh, we had money left over, and so they've extended us to the end of this year. So we're still working. This is our uh, logo. I'll just say a few things about it. So our acronym. These are actually in three dimensions. They're buildings. The ones that don't have two slices also become trees. And the thing pointing down is the sensor. So you've got combinations of buildings and trees, which represents a large fraction of the urban surface. And the, the ellipse here actually means something to those of us who study uh, atmospheric uh, processes. That's kind of the shape on the ground that affects a measurement of a climate parameter made near the ground. So it's something we call a source area. And of course, it's Canadian, so a little on our logo. Um, what actually do we do? And I, so again, I'm going to give you a, a sense of the project. And then at the last sort of half of the slides is going to be a little bit about how it interfaces or it doesn't in, in some ways with digital scholarship. So we're a, a scientific research network. We have a finite life. And our job is to, in, in this particular case, undertake observations, modeling, and remote sensing, which is a particular type of observation, of the atmosphere and characteristics over uh, cities for the purpose of uh, achieving some scientific objectives. The, the geography of the project is, is a bit odd in the sense that Western is actually nominally the lead institution, but no activities are actually happening here. Uh, but there's a good rationale for that. We have a long history of doing work in Montreal and Vancouver with our partners. And so we're exploiting the fact that we have sites that already exist there. Uh, the sites are directed towards residential parts of the city. And uh, believe it or not, um, those are actually understudied in terms of our understanding of how cities affect weather and climate. So oftentimes when people look at urban climate, they've looked at the most densely developed parts of the cities, which at least in North America are not very representative in terms of the surface area they cover. So suburbs and vegetated area, uh, and residential areas cover a much larger fraction of the city surface. And so that's what our study is focused on. There's some pictures here from some of our sites that a little bit hard to see. The, the mandate of, of the project is really about achieving our research objectives. So just to give some context in terms of um, how we approach the digital element of the scholarship, I think it's important to know that unlike NSERC, for example, CFCAS is, does not have a, a big mandate on HQP, so highly qualified personnel coming out, although of course they're interested in it. And it's not particularly outreach centered, at least not to the public in our case, although there are some opportunities there. Uh, what we're supposed to be doing, and uh, everybody here has some links to what we're doing in some way in the sense that you all probably at least half pay attention to a weather forecast and probably more than likely complain about a weather forecast <laughs> at one point. So what we're on is on the road to developing uh, the capacity for having urban scale forecasts in, in Canadian cities. And so that, that forecast capability is about both weather and air quality. And so there's elements of safety and security in here because it also has to do with uh, atmospheric modeling for the purposes of uh, monitoring accidental or intentional releases of, of pollutants into the air. Uh, cities, at least in Canada, occupy a relatively small fraction of the surface area, but they incorporate a large fraction of the population. So one of the rationales for why, why bother studying uh, urban areas from a weather and climate perspective is the fact that, well, that's where most of the population lives, so why not? Even though I'm, the large scale weather is going to depend on other elements of the, the surface characteristics. Um, Funding agency requirements, so again, this is context for how we approach digital scholarship. Uh, in our particular case, we have to have a minimum number of members of the network, i.e., we are working with members of other institutions as a matter of uh, requirement. Uh, we're allowed to have uh, international and government partners, which then also provides challenges for how you interact with them. The budget, uh, 
explicitly provides for and in fact uh, mandates in some cases uh, outreach and collaboration activities between the members of the networks and we're also required to have annual workshops where in, in addition to the digital world we bring the actual bodies together put them in a room for about a day and a half seems to be their tolerance before they feel they need to go somewhere else and uh, work on on both the planning and, and uh, assessment of how the network's going. And we also have a requirement that our data eventually has to be made public. So there's maybe a little bit of uh, non-open access element that comes with the network in the sense that there is a provision for the network to hold on to the data and keep it private for the opportunity of the students, for example, to finish their thesis and to achieve, you know, if you're doing a PhD, you're supposed to be the creating new knowledge. So we have that capability. And there's even restrictions within the network about how we sometimes share some of that data in order to preserve those uh, capabilities. But eventually, all the data is supposed to be made public. And public in this case, it, it probably is being made public mostly for a scientific type audience rather than a public one. But it, it depends. I, I mean, we recognize the different op uh, audiences we have out there. So just a little bit in terms of what, what actually is happening within the network. So I'm going to show you some slides with pictures to illustrate the different segments uh, or elements that make up EPIC. So there's observations and remote sensing and modeling. So observations are conducted of the characteristics of the atmosphere over cities. And uh, we're doing that at six sites, four of which are urban and two of which are comparative or comparison rural sites. Over the cities, typically what you see is a tower that's somewhere between about 25 and 30 meters high, and, and we measure a regular set of variables uh, on that tower using a, a set of, there's kind of a standardized set of instruments that we'll deploy. These things are not your everyday go to the Environment Canada website, what's the conditions at London Airport. So these are uh, instruments that make some specialized measurements that provide a, a lot more detail on, on the processes that are happening between the surface and the atmosphere. It allows us to measure the actual heat fluxes and evaporation and also the carbon exchange coming off the surface and going to the atmosphere. And it does, so, so basically what we're doing is measuring a whole bunch of variables that create time series. So if you're into data, here's data that consists of time series and the original data is sampled at rates of 20 times per second or more. So there's huge volumes of data that are initially collected and which then get boiled down sometimes automatically by computers or data loggers and sometimes through uh, post-processing operations that eventually yield what would be publicly available to averages of 5 to 30 minutes. And these stations ran for, in some cases, up to four years continuously. Some, not all stations at the same, had the same time frame and, and in Montreal, we had a focus on wintertime operations, so we didn't always run in the summer, but a lot of data this way. We also have data that uh, comes from point locations, but which might be in a different format than your traditional time series. This is an image, well, there's three images here. Two are coupled. The, the image on the far left is of a laser that point, uh, sits on the ground and points upwards, shoots a beam of light out, and can... Retrie uh, retrieve back from the light that gets scattered back uh, information about the height of what we call the boundary layer over the, over the city. So there's a, a layer of the atmosphere over the city that's affected by the surface below it, and this is a time series of, of the height of that boundary layer. So we can tell from the reflectivity what the top of that layer is, and we can plot it as a time series. So there's some image data and time series that gets plotted in two-dimensional form that becomes important for the network. And we also do some profiling, in this case with balloons that hoist some instruments and then we actually have them tethered when it works. We've lost them on occasion, much to the <laughs> distress of air traffic control. What do you mean your balloon's not there anymore? Uh, so they, they go up and down on a couple hundred meters of, of, of the atmosphere, get deployed from interesting places like cemeteries. We also collect data in other sort of non-traditional means. One of the objectives of EPIC was to look at winter climates in Canadian cities, and so we had uh, 
sampling of snow characteristics in different types of environments that, that came about. And I'm showing this because I'll make a comment later about one of the one of the possibilities of how you can use digital scholarship in, in a mode like this is to try to make use of the population base to add to your data. And we didn't do that in our project, but I have seen it in uh, other cases where they, where they use the fact that people could report in their own observations to try to build a database. So in our case, we're limited to our own, but it's not always a, that, uh, that restriction doesn't have to be there in the digital world. And we also have, this is actually a stitched together image. These are thermal images, so a scan, it's a, in terms of temperature of buildings at, near our, one of our Montreal sites during the winter time, you can see the temperature contrast, the roofs are cold, so they're relatively well insulated and covered with snow. So we have two dimensional image data that becomes part of our data uh, base as well. On the uh, remote sensing front, remote sensing typically is geographical in that, it, in that it's giving you two dimensions, x, y data with some characteristic in either a, a pixel or maybe a vector format. And we did, uh, most of our remote sensing data in EPIC had to do with uh, something called LIDAR, which is also laser based. And essentially what it is, it's a very fine scale ability to make a, a map of the surface structure. So you put the laser in an airplane, instead of putting it on the ground this time, put it in an airplane, you fly it over the, over the surface of the earth and you get basically a high resolution topography of the surface of the earth, and in this case over a city. And if you do post-processing on it, you can actually extract individual buildings. And in our case, because we're interested in vegetation, we can actually extract the trees and vegetated elements too. So we can actually build up in, in our study areas a really good understanding, this is down at scales of about one, uh, one meter square, uh, the, the actual surface structure of the city that's affecting our measurement. So two-dimensional data. And then on the modeling front, uh, just a little background on how do you get to an urban scale model. So when you go onto Environment Canada's website, you're looking at something like this, and it comes from a nest nested model situation that looks like, starts out at a 33 kilometer grid resolution that covers the whole world, and goes to a regional model that looks something like this, over North America, and then in certain instances may use what's called a local area model that goes down to about a resolution of 2.5 kilometers. So the model only knows what's happening at about 2.5 kilometers, and the model at best only represents these kinds of surfaces. That they don't actually have urban areas in the model at present. So well, how do we go from there to building in urban areas? Well, you can nest even a little bit higher resolution, another local area model, and then at the urban scale, we're looking at uh, 10 times better spatial resolution, so about 250 meters is the resolution at which we build in our urban component. And that urban component through EPIC uh, is a representation of both what we call the built component, the buildings, and the vegetation. And at present, we actually run them separately in what we call a tile scheme. So we just, we run two separate models that represent how the built environment reacts to the atmosphere and the vegetated one does. And then we weight them according to uh, how much area is covered in vegetation versus uh, is covered in the built environment and eventually as part of the research project we're actually going to integrate those components uh, and include testing of snow and the ability to model green roofs as part of that. And that, here's an example of, of running that model. This is uh, Montreal and showing you a uh, surface temperature. This is actually run down to about 120 meter resolution. So this, this is the future in terms of uh, the resolution at which we can start to represent uh, the environment over, over urban areas. So we're going to have this model that has a lot of different applications, uh, emergency response, planning of urban areas, uh, water use, climate impact and adaptation, health. So lots of intended outcomes that can be used down the road. But what about digital scholarship? What's our interaction with the digital scholarship world? Well, the main portal Epic's used as being a website. And in fact, uh, Martin was involved in getting our website completely redesigned, and they spent a lot of time in trying to make something that can service the three sorts of users that we envision. 
And I think to date, most of what we've uh, targeted at our audience is that of the EPIC participants themselves and the research community in general. So it's a bit more of a scientific audience than, than a user audience of the public. We have, a, a, by necessity, to make our data available to both members of the network and to other users. And we do this through an online database, maybe not quite as fancy as David's, but uh, you can select by station or you can select by parameter and you can extract. And in this case, we've limited our database only to those time series fields. So only the stuff that's on the towers we make available. The 2D data is just too complicated to try to store in a common format. Um, one of the big advantages in terms of free scholarship for our project is the fact that it's very difficult to get the permissions, the funding, and the people together to make a project like this happen in terms of observations. So the legacy of those observations usually far outweigh or far outlasts the actual project itself. So we've already had requests from modeling groups around the world to use our data because we're one of the few projects that have looked, for example, at wintertime conditions in cities, which is a challenge in terms of uh, making good observations under those conditions. So uh, the, the free information exchange here is that uh, the project can help suffice uh, needs of other research groups both now and into the future. We get um, participation from the larger community through digital means by participating in, in uh, forums such as this one, the International Association for Urban Climate, and they have a newsletter that goes out to a distribution list of over 1,500 people. It's completely digital. It has a section in it where people report on projects, and so it's a way of advertising beyond our own website uh, what's happening in a particular project, and it's a free association, so that helps increase the membership and, the, and our visibility. This is another way that our uh, EPIC is represented, and uh, this isn't EPIC work directly, but it's work by one of our members. It's actually a, an online um, resource called the Urban Flux Network, and I'll just show it to you here because it's kind of cool. It's a really uh, quick geographical interface to um, some of the main parameters that associate that are associated with um, these projects. And so if you go, you can find all these stations worldwide and you can do it through the, the menu at the left or you can do it through the map. And each of the sites is characterized in terms of some of the parameters that people in the community would need to know, say if they were gonna use the observations or, or to model it. So some characteristics about the, the tower from which measurements were made. Uh, there's some stuff on the, not clicking, but you can see the tabs here. Anyways, on, on the site, uh, if there's photos, they'll be posted. No photos for this one. And then any publications that came about from that particular project. So kind of a neat interface that gives you a quick overview of, of the project in that particular part of the, the world. And, and EPIC sites are represented in this, in this uh, online database. The other thing would... Uh, we. We have started to use, and this again is credit to Andreas Kristen at, at UBC, is uh, online interfaces to the data. So we have the ability to look at the data online and plot up graphs. So for potential users who are looking for uh, data from a particular station or um, a particular day, they can use this um, approach to doing a quick search as opposed to downloading the whole database file and searching themselves. And we're also not very far away from trying to make this real time. And in fact, Andreas has actually started to do this for some parameters, although they're not necessarily parameters most people would be very interested in. So you can now, if you buy the infrastructure, you can get the instruments to provide the data in near real time. But that kind of information is only useful to certain users who have certain tolerances. So there's no quality control or quality assurance on that data. Uh, so it limits its use uh, to certain applications. And it would require that in a proposal you'd have to know ahead of time to build into your budget that you're going to add that infrastructure. And this is my last slide, so this is just a look uh, in a future look in terms of how 
some digital scholarship from EPIC and follow-on activities might occur. And so one, one thing that's happening in terms of Environment Canada, who are the agency developing this model, is they have a firewall around them that prevents access except by Environment Canada people. And so one thing we're currently trying to do is build a portal through that firewall that would allow potential users of this urban scale modeling system to use it for their applications. And so one thing that's happening here at Western now is, is uh, a couple of us in geography in combination with um, some hydrologists over in engineering have just got some money to study green roofs. And this is, we've been running for about uh, the last four months on one of the engineering buildings as set up to test green roofs. And we're gonna, at the urban scale, look at the ability of that urban scale modeling system developed through EPIC to, to see how green roofs could contribute to changes in urban climate at the urban scale. But that provides a whole set of challenges on digital scholarship in terms of access and all that kind of jazz. Thanks for inviting me, Adrian. And um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, you know, bear some similarities to what David was talking about when Jamie was talking about. That is, I'm going to talk about my own project and I'm going to talk about um, where I'd like to see it go and the links I see with other projects that are out there that are kind of similar. Um, so uh, just to start, what my research focuses on, um, as we pointed out at the beginning, is on Malagasy, which is the language from Madagascar. Now you say Madagascar and this is what most people think about, right? Um, I just want to point out that there are no penguins in Madagascar. Um, but really, um, Madagascar is here, in case anyone wants to know. And uh, this is a closer look at the island. And thus far, most of my research has been done in the capital, which is right in the center of the island here. Um, though um, I, my new project is with people here and with researchers up in the northern part of the island, too. Um, now, uh, I do have a database, uh, as was mentioned. In fact, this database, I was thinking about it here. I think it was created in 1995, and it was sitting on some little old Macs. You know those Macs with those tiny screens? Um, and so Lisa Travis had this built. And then um, when I came here to Western, uh, we thought it'd be a great idea if we could make it uh, available online. So this is something uh, that we did. And. Uh, this database is kind of, for the moment, a, uh, a very jazzy um, dictionary. That's one way of thinking about it. And so one of the things that, that Lisa and I have been thinking about is where we want to take this um, the database. But I'll show you what it is for now. Um, so this is what you would see if you went to that link. And basically, the database um, is set up to allow you to search for the roots of words, um, for word forms, or for actual data. And, and the reason it's set up this way is because of the way the Malagasy language works. So all words um, are built from these roots, and you can have a sort of like, you have the root joy in English, and then you can make the word enjoy, and then you can make the bigger word enjoyment. So you think about a process like that, that's what's going on all over the place in this language. Why the things are divided up the way they are. And so when you go to this database, you could say, well, I'm really interested in this root, um, Adina, I'm going to search on it. So, sorry, it's kind of small, isn't it? But anyway, what you get is you, you get the meaning of it. So it's a word that means question or perhaps exam. It's a noun. And then you can say, OK, this is a root. What are the forms that, I can, that come out of this root? And you get this big list. And then for each form, you can say, well, how do I use this in a sentence? And um, you can, then you get a list of this. So these are sentences. Um, in, in Malagasy with um, a gloss, which is essentially a word-by-word -word translation, and then an English translation. Um, you also have in here information about where the sentence comes from, so if it's from a dictionary or from a novel, or just I was working with a speaker and they said this sentence. So th those are the bits of, the in of information that are there. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's about, you know, like I said, it's kind of a glorified dictionary at this point. Um, it is, and um, there are various people contributing to it, myself and Lisa Travis, but also she has some research assistants in Malaga, in research assistants in Montreal, uh, adding data to it, and we have collaborators in, in North America. Um, but like I said, I think it's kind of stalled at this point because uh, we just don't really see where to take it from now. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> 
I have, so actually I'm really interested in, if people have ideas about what to do with linguistic databases, I'd you know, love to hear from you. Um, but the, the new project is um, to sort of take the next step and look more at the way Malagasy is spoken across the island. So like I said, up until now I've been focusing on the, the way the language is spoken in the capital. Um, so, you know, inspired quite a bit by David's work, I thought, okay, well, we should look at, at this variation. Because there is variation, it's not um, acknowledged by the government so much, but it's there. So um, I was quite fortunate and I received a SHRC standard research grant, in fact, I guess one of the last standard research grants. Um, and uh, this project involves uh, three Canadians, so David, uh, Lisa Travis, and myself, four Americans, and four uh, researchers from Madagascar. And the idea is to, like I said, to look at the varieties of Malagasy as it's spoken on the island, and to make the results available um, you know, in North America and Europe, but also in Madagascar itself. And basically what that means because of um, you know, limited access to the internet is that we are also going to be pr producing print materials. Okay, so this is why I say both high tech and low tech. It's okay. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the project and it's just started and David's about to take off to Madagascar, you know, all goes well, uh, to, get, to get this rolling, so we are just at the beginning of it. And, and where I see this going um, is in um, what was the project itself, but I also see it as being linked to other projects that are out there. So um, this field of looking at one particular language, but the, the varieties of it is one that's growing quite a bit recently. So we have David's project, for example. There's a lot of work being done in Europe looking at the dialects spoken in Italy, in uh, Holland, all over the place. And so um, I'd, I'd like to um, be able to take advantage of the fact that people have already been sorting through different kinds of methodologies and also ways of sharing data. So I just wanted to point to um, one network, um, Edison, which is basically this, uh, a sort of a site that points you to other sites. So it's a collection of um, different projects that have been looking at um, dialect syntax. And um, so there's, there's various different uh, projects, and I won't show you them all, but they're mainly in Europe. However, if you do network by country, you see, I actually managed to get my, my name listed there because um, they were quite excited about the work that I was planning on doing. So even though Malagasy is not a language of Europe, they, they said, okay, you can be part of our, part of our group. So eventually, um, I hope to be able to link the actual data that comes out of this um, here because one of the things you can do on this site is you can search across all the databases. So let's say I'm really interested in um, question words. You know, then I could say, okay, well, in these databases, what are all the sentences that have question words in them, whether they're in Irish or Galician or Malagasy, for example. That would be a very broad search, but it gives you an idea of what you could do. Um, so, so this is one um, connection between this project that I'm, I'm just starting and other stuff that's out there. And the other um, connection is that of, in the Edison um, projects, there's one uh, project that has been developed quite a bit about dialects of Dutch. Um, and they've gone a route that's very similar to what David's data is, the direction that David's data are taking, I guess that you could say. So they've created an online syntactic atlas of Dutch dialects. So um, what does this look like? So here's a picture of their website. You can obviously do all sorts of different kinds of searches um, depending what you're interested in, and, but then the result can be something like a map, which everyone loves, right? Like, so here's a map which shows you, I don't even speak German so I, or Dutch, so I have no idea what this is. It's, um, it's um, three auxiliary verbs, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> They look like lots of haves and gots or something like that. Anyway, they just show you where in the, um, in the regions that they, where they did these questionnaires, where people use which version. OK? 
okay? So you can kind of look for um, dialect areas. So this is just one example of something you could look for um, and then create some, some nice map. So obviously, our project is nowhere near being able to do something like this. We're going to be going to perhaps four villages in Madagascar, um, but the idea is that, you know, with enough time and, and you know, uh, if we get enough funding to be able to continue to hire people to go out and do these um, interviews, that we could come up with something more like this. Okay, so um, one of the uh, guiding questions that we were, we were given before coming before you today was to talk about what we think the role of Western is in all of this. So, you know, I, with my colleagues, we go and ask the federal government for money. Well, what, what do I expect from Western in terms of support? Well, I think that, um, you know, we really need support from, in some form, for creating and maintaining these kinds of databases. Um, uh, because there are obvious, you know, things are changing all the time and you have these issues with your font or, or whatever. I think, um, you know, if we really want to be visible as a research intensive university, we need these um, websites and databases to be accessible and functioning. Um, and at the same time, uh, we, as I said earlier on, is that we can't leave paper behind. Because, like, in Madagascar, there is just no way that an online database is going to be of use to anyone, even the people at the university, because their internet access is terrible. So, um, we do still need to keep in mind that, you know, it, we would like to be producing, say, print dictionaries or other language materials out of this. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> That's all, and I just wanted to thank uh, the various parties that have funded bits of my research, so the Canada Research Chair Program, SHRC, and Research at Western, and I like this little, I was looking at Jamie's things, he had all these logos, I didn't have any logos, but I have a Canadian flag. This is a great opportunity to uh, explore these research projects and researchers further, so. Question? Vince will have a question, I knew, I could tell Vince had a question, yes. Uh, <laughs> Jamie, what format are you saving the epic data in? Uh, what's the database structure that you're using, or is it just a flat ASCII file? Yeah, so you download it basically as com separated values. Okay. And we we um, commission is that the right word? Uh, ITS to build it for us. Okay. Because uh, one of the problems with a lot of databases is that they're saved in a proprietary format. And when that proprietary format vanishes, you're left with useless data. So the ASCII is certainly the, the preferable way to save it. Yeah, one, jo one job we've also been doing, or Martin has actually been doing this month, was just making an entire backup so that we have the capability of handing a DVD over to somebody yeah. that wants the data that doesn't necessarily have a group. So, and it's kind of mandated by the agency that we do these things. Where will the data be deposited once the project runs out of money? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess it comes back to me as PI and the fact that I'm here to keep it going. So that's, I guess that's an answer to what Elena was saying in terms of institutional support is that, okay, so my project paid for the ITS support during the time of the project and what I really tried to do is save enough money so that at the very end I could say here I'm going to pay for as much as I can in terms of my website and in fact our website we actually had to go off campus because they didn't support PHP or something our web developer didn't like the resources on campus and and the web developer wasn't a stranger to campus he's the developer for the Biotron's web page too I think amongst others and so you know, we're paying a commercial provider for our website, and you can only pay for so many years in advance, right? So, inflation being what it is. Um, so I guess it comes back to me, or the next grant or something, to, to do that. But to their credit, I think ITS is being, doesn't seem to have been giving us bills, and please, if you're from ITS, don't. Don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> Well, before we move but, yeah. on to the next question, I wanted to just put a little commercial in here because the 
data and stewardship of data is the next great frontier as far as libraries are concerned. And so I encourage you to speak to a friendly neighborhood librarian to see what could be done and perhaps use your project as a pilot project. I've been talking to Research Western about the need and, and sort of building up, so just to leave you with that particular thought, all of you actually. S similar story, but on more of a shoestring in the humanities, because we get grants that don't usually cover research infrastructure. So both Malagasy and Alpi and another project, plus a student's files, all ran on a single box server for seven, eight years, uh, which eventually died server death. And we um, went off campus to a provider because the virtual machine on campus, we, again, to run PHP and MySQL, on a campus machine, they want you to be on an isolated slice because they don't trust PHP and as Jamie said, they don't support it. So we took it off campus uh, to a, private, uh, a provider which is very cost effective for the time being. Uh, we don't know how long that'll last, but at least we can do what we need to do in terms of running these databases. And this, I mean, this is a rocket science database. These are very basic PHP that calls the MySQL server. Um, and you know, the, the, all of the data isn't a really big chunk, so it's not that much bandwidth that we can pay for more if we need to. Uh, but yeah, we, we're re refugees from ITS's cost structure. So if the library wants to pick it up, that's great. And How much geographic data do you track in your records when it's being transcribed? Uh, because it would seem interesting to look at flows of uh, the diction that's used or the the way the word is spoken and how that spreads, or if it spreads, or if you thought isolated. Well, it, it's all ge geopoint. I mean, there are 527 points on the, the okay. Iberian Peninsula, so it's, it, all of it is localized. Okay. Um, but there's no flow because there's a single, usually a single, two speakers were recorded at each spot, and there's no real time. So it, it's, it's a single snapshot. It's a very interesting okay. snapshot because it's 1930s, it's basically pre modern, pre industrial Spain. Um, but it's, it's a single historical uh, snapshot, which is a nice baseline then to compare to what's happened since, which are d documented in various places. But the flow is, we like to say in linguistic geography and in language variation that a, a snapshot has implicit motion in it. So if you, if you look at geographic data and you're lucky and you look at it in the right play, there is play, way, there is implicit motion, but there isn't any real-time change in what we've got here. Yes, Mark. Um, yeah, I was wondering if, uh, well, for the linguistic projects, do you have um, any kind of uh, plan to incorporate multimedia platforms like, um, you know, these plugins for audio or video or picture uh, related to the different uh, points on the map that you're collecting data? So for the, like, the SAN project, the one in Holland, they do have audio files, and we're planning to for this, like I don't have uh, my data that I've collected up until now, there's no audio. But moving forward with this new project, definitely. So I would like, ideally, yes, you to be able to click on that sentence and hear it. Yeah. For the Alpi, there wasn't any audio taken. They were the pioneers of audio recording in the Iberian Peninsula, but at that time you had to go to the, the studio in Madrid. So in fact, the, the first voice recordings were done by the same team. They're on um, like flat disks and they've been remastered to CDs, but it's not geographic in that case. It's just the people that they could get into the studio and do it. Um, it's a gorgeous audio. But this stuff is hand transcription. So you, it, to make audio, and one of my Catalan catalogs has done this, you, you, it's a matter of synthesizing from the transcriptions to voice. Uh, and, and then you have to, it's, it's very complex to, to piece it together so the syllables sound vaguely plausible, right? Um, it, we're a long way from having that. And I'm not sure it's worth the effort to have this sort of synthesized historical what we think it kind of more sort of should have sounded like. Um, one of the coolest things, some of the coolest linguistic atlases have that, and they tend to be in uh, small areas like Holland, or there's an area in uh, Romance, Switzerland. Uh, the last speakers of uh, Franco Provencal varieties, you can literally click and see the audio and video of these very elderly speakers sitting by their hearth speaking a, a vanishing variety of Franco Provencal. But that's Switzerland, right? So it's real small area, very, very richly varied area, but geographically small area with um, significant resources. And um, so do you find um, any kind of challenge in identifying a particular kind of pronunciation in uh, metropolis areas? Like if you were to do this kind of study in Toronto, I would imagine that you'd find a 
whole bunch of different pronunciations of a given word. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah. we're 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 choosing rural areas. Yeah. On purpose. The, the, the bias in traditional dialectology is towards is towards uh, rural, which are thought, conceived of as being uh, more conservative. Uh, more stable. It's not exactly true, but I mean, that's the, that was the traditional bias. So all of this data was from rural speakers. Urban sampling has been done in the second half of the 20th century, and you sort of get the, the, the other axis, right? You lose the geographic axis, and you have a very complex stack of social variables for urban dialectology. And there's there's a fair amount of that done uh, in, in the English-speaking world, right? So you get you gain in richness in this dimension, what you lose in richness in the geographic dimension. Um, it's very hard to model both of them, just because of the the complexity of, of projecting social society across space or space within social dimensions. Um, yeah, nobody funds linguists to do things that are that information rich. One or the other is usually the most we can ask, we can ask for. Other comments and questions? A few more minutes here. Other than Vincent just told you got some private conversations afterwards with the but in it. Going once, twice, three times. Okay, Vince, go ahead. Uh, Jamie, you said that the results that are publicly available are the five to thirty-minute averages. What happens with the original data as it's captured? Are those retained and available so that if someone decided they wanted to look at them in a different fashion, could they be manipulated? So. Um, the really high frequency data, it doesn't really mean anything for most users uh, until it's processed. And the processing is not just a matter of averaging it, it typically incorporates a number of corrections. But the way we would operate it is if somebody did have an application for that level of data, then there, there are some studies, you know, if you're trying to study turbulence directly, you need the high frequency data, you would go to the person who collected it. But the, so what we store is useful to the great majority of potential users. But the other data hasn't been lost, so to speak. It's still available somewhere? Uh, it's in the hands of the original collector. So it's not in the hands of a network, per se. Of course, if this was Spain, the original collector would then will this to his children as a person who lends <laughs> About the urban data, there is a good public project. Um, Jack Chambers, who is the Dean of Canadian Dialectologists, has a project, a series of projects called Dialect Topography, uh, which surveyed originally the Golden Horseshoe, actually at two 10-year, I think, 15-year intervals, and then a, a couple of other areas in English-speaking Canada. And it's a, it's a different kind of survey. It's a postal survey, but it is all, all online for people to download and play with. So it is, I, I send my students to look at it because it's related to the, the English that they speak. And they can they can graph it and, and play with it. It's it's public data. Well, I, I got, we have to you know, students waiting. I think, but I just wanted to say that today's panel is not a one-off event uh, related to scholarly uh, uh, communication. Uh, there are the information moves on on campus uh, to raise uh, Western communities' awareness of scholarly publishing, and also uh, Western libraries will host two workshops on open access. Uh, and if you see our website or, or our, our, our walking expert here, Adrian Cole, for, for details. I also want to announce today, but there will be more details forthcoming, that Western Libraries is going to sponsor um, a subsidy program for open access publishing, which will help um, scholars publish in open access vehicles, because there is always a cost involved. It's, it's a wonderful principle, but there's the practicality. So we want to encourage more open access uh, dissemination, so more details uh, to follow. Um, now, I want to thank our three speakers today, uh, David Heap, uh, uh, Jamie Boot, and, and Lama Paul. And uh, they provide examples, I think, of the opportunities and excitement associated with digital scholarship. And I'm sure you were so restrained today, there was so much you could have said and shared, and I'm sure you're available if anybody wants to contact you. But I, I learned a great deal, and also learned a great deal about some of the uh, uh, systemic things that might be impediments to, to researchers in the Western. And I also want to thank Adrian Ho, who's the Scholarly Communication Librarian for Western Libraries, and his colleagues on the Western Library Scholarly Communication uh, Committee, some of whom are here today, uh, Monica Pushkos, Vince Gray, Liz Mance, uh, Margaret Martin Gardner, Jennifer Robinson, and Shee Shea. And they helped to organize this afternoon's event. 
and a thank you to Rayanne Teichert, who, uh, probably to their chagrin, have um, filmed uh, this particular event, and it will be posted on the web. And I want to thank you all, the audience, for your participation and contributions. And we have some modest gifts, which, ironically enough, celebrate the physical library uh, at Wembertawa Digital Scholarship. Uh, these are a series of cards that we commissioned a couple of years ago, uh, which um, highlight some of the collections, our 10 million item physical collections we have uh, associated with our various uh, libraries within Western Libraries. So thank you so much. Big hand for our people.